Um, my name is Sid, I go by My grandparents come from Switzerland, Norway. I was born and raised in Washington, and I have lived on my hand since I was 18. Um, you'll have to forgive me uh, if any of my Klingit translations are incorrect. <laughs> I've been a while since I've actually worked on grammar and speaking in front of you all, so I appreciate your patience. Um, I lived on my own in Hunting Camp since I was 18. Uh, my son, Rose's father, in the Stanley Thompson, he belongs to the Kuf Wuhit of the Son of Khan Fekhali. My daughter's father is Stanley Adams in Nishan. He is Ida Double Headed Eagle, Beaver Grand Theater. Um, my children, Lola, Kaylee, and Rob, are all gay and feminine adults. Um, and have been my most practicing great chance in my language learning journey. Uh, I'm dedication to liberating the store of fruits um, on their and your ancestral lands here on the planet bottom. Uh, for a while, it was in your time, and today I'll tell you story. I appreciate you all for being here to support me and this work we have done. Today, my aim is to shed light on some more accurate explanations of our local history here in Ketchikan. I would also like to share at the time that this is sort of truth of our community and the glorious name you will hear throughout the presentation may be shocking. Um, to hear a darker side than what you have been taught before. And this is a common feature of discussions on history when we compare what we've been taught in school versus what is reported in all of its authenticity. I also want to inform you that I'll be including terminology used in the past, which is unethical and which I do not uh, myself use in conversations that I've been forward. I welcome questions and commentary at the end of the presentation. And uh, if I need to pause at any point in time, uh, I welcome uh, communication and conversation throughout this process. And I can thank every person listening to Kirksaw the Creek, another chapter on stolen land. Me. Okay, so I'm going Okay. Um, it in the story content. So I think you want to just bring up your Zoom. Oh, to make it to where you can your whole picture. Yeah. 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 Uh, in researching historic concept, when it involves a certain culture of people, it is paramount to research and receive permissions um, from those being discussed. In this presentation, the plain dead individuals I'll be naming are the ancestors of the current land leader, James Lono Sr., land leader of Kaylee Kutit, Chuck Denny, land leader of Kaylee Kutit. Harvey Shields, Nate Adin, Chop, Hulu, Hit, Clan Leader, for all of today's Sunday Clan, Nate Adin. Richard Van Richard Jackson, Take Wiggy, Props, Hit, Clan Leader, for all of today's Quanta Clan, Take Wiggy. Clan Leader, Chief, for allowing me to share the screen on the whole brings. According to Klingon informants, Kajikan Creek is originally noted as Sami Kwan in any territory. In Olsen's uh, social structure and social life, though, he has claimed it in Alaska. So in 1800, it passed to the Tonsa Kwan as a gift. A made chief married a Tonsa Kwan woman of the Kajikan clan, and that was that he gave it to his brothers in law who were in Kaba. On the right, uh, we're looking at the 1900 plot of the Kitchenan town site. Outlined in red, illustrates the territory and village site of the Tonsa Kwan peoples. You may have heard this region being formally depicted as a near summer fishing site for local natives. Uh, but to the contrary, many native landowners from 1901 landscape inform us that their people have been stakeholders in the territory with year-round posts for many generations. Please also note uh, on the back of these giveaways between the words Indian village. You guys kind of see that on your screen, that little rectangle in the middle, that long back of the bridge. Um, 
uh, between the words that he and Dylan was using. You will hear testimony on the Surrey Bridge, which was built by the hands of forward indigenous men who owned property in their specific territory illustrated. Pictured at the right is the chart of Villagigato Island, where Ketchikan sits, as well as the neighboring islands in what is now claimed as Ketchikan Gaby Borough, as well as Melanchella and part of Pensacola Island. Here you can see a breakdown of regional ownership provided by public shares of Sea Alaska as well as Gold Trent costs, compiling the knowledge provided by Lincoln elders like Henry Denny, uh, James Starridge, and Esther Jackson, Jackson Shea. Um, just to name a few of many, James Wano Sr., I think what the plan later mentioned earlier, actually worked with Esther Shea on this project to compile the place names in a spreadsheet before the works began turning being published. Good to see to everyone who worked on this. As you can see, this encompasses uh, Kwame Kwan, as well as the mention of Tonta Donahadi ownership in Fort Stewart and the aforementioned Tonta ownership of Kitchen Canyon Creek in Highland region. This compilation of traditional place names is, in fact, concrete evidence of indigenous land ownership throughout Southeast Alaska. Place names are a historic record of origin and migration patterns and should therefore be admitted as evidence in an equal fashion to the local context. Cultural representation is a vital puzzle piece uh, in solving matters of land ownership spanning back many generations. In Southeast Alaska, a demonstration of cultural representation can be witnessed in what is named in claim that you can be as a boom. A boom describes sacred ownership of many things, including regalia, property, land, and kutia. Kutia is the word for totem pole, just as kia is the word for shizzle. In Kajikan, this place of Aku can be seen through Kutia on many origins of historic record. In Klingit law, Aku cannot be exchanged or dissolved. It is sacred on property that must be respected. Theft or moving of such property is an extreme insult and would certainly merit consequence and would call for retribution. As you can see, examples of such are the Chief Johnson Pole, the Chief Kine Pole, the Chief Scout Pole, and even the Pot Spare Pole, like, what, like the one in Saxman, as well as another depiction at Totem Bite. You will hear in the testimony of the land owners in the 1901 case that they were condescendingly interrogated uh, by the opposition as to the whereabouts of said Totem Pole at the time. This was a tactic to prove Indigenous habitation in Kachikan at the time. This was a fraudulent tactic uh, because those colonizing in Kachikan were taking down those phone poles, moving them around as school teams, burned down their houses, and built up material grounds. Historically, land movements for indigenous peoples in the United States have been convoluted con and ultimately deceptive. Land and property laws have been at the pinnacle of civil rights since the inception of the nation. Using such as a premise for alleviating the capacity of which any particular individual exercise their rights to own property, as well as the personification of any human being, as well as a baseline and the determinant as to whether they have the respect among white men to have a voice in the laws which govern them. Ways of exercising these sort of trivial tests as it applies to Alaska natives, was frequently facilitating English written tests um, and invariably eradicating culture in virtue of forced religious indoctrination. If an Alaska native person were determined to have not passed the observant investigations, they were denied fundamental rights and citizenship. Before introducing a colonial timeline in Ketchikan, a critical detail to have introduced to May 17, 1884, Organic Act, and how it specifically applies to Ketchikan's land status at the time of documented conveyed deeds, as well as the time of the case to follow. The Act reads in Section 10, quote, 
that the Indians or other persons in said district shall not be disturbed in the possessions of any lands actually in their use or occupation or now claimed by them, but the terms under which such person may acquire his title to such use is reversed for future legislation by Congress. Additionally, in the case in Bollock's Alaska Natives and American Laws, quote, the 1884 Organic Act extended federal laws related to mining claims to Alaska and established the first framework for territorial civil government. Prior to 1884, Organic Act, Alaska had been governed as a military district. We can, me, we can conclude from this that a indigenous land occupants were seen as owners of the territories in which they actively inhabit and use, but also that B, the Organic Act was strategically written with a door left open for Congress to claim the right to change their at any given time to suit their needs, regardless of what that might look like on an ethical basis. In Ketchikan, this loophole was later used um, was later used to deliberate on whether that act should apply to the tribe lands versus lands further from the tribe. Having established a record of indigenous land ownership in Southeast Alaska, specifically plaintiff people in the Ketchikan Gateway Borough, let's now walk through a historic colonial timeline. This designation is named such to demonstrate non aboriginal inhabitants who migrated to the Ketchikan region and therefore play a role in the unraveling of what Ketchikan is today. We evidenced in the outline of the 1884 Organic Act for the land ownership being in habitation and active use. It is important to recognize the cultural practice among the native peoples to voice back and forth throughout the Southeast Alaska region for hunting, fishing, and gathering practices. This was and still is essential for survival and nutritional preservation. You also see many multi generational homes as a standard practice. When taken into the context of census records from in Southeast Alaska, you will often see notes in the report um, of the reporters stating no one was home. Unfortunately, this was a tactic used to disprove ownership and moving land. This is because the Euro American standard of a nuclear household overreaching in pursuit of standardizing of cultural cultures outside of their home. This was also during the time of Indian boarding schools, when children were forced out of their homes. The timeline of such events is so visibly static that we must critically align the existence of injustice with the existence of Ketchikan as we know it today. Let's begin our timeline in the 1800s. Uh, Charlie Dixon, Charles Dixon, is reported to have been born in August of 1839 in the Ketchikan Lately Borough along the Cape Fox John. In December of 1842, Thomas Jordan in 1862, Johnson in November 1863, Don Niles Cage. Uh, in July 1867, and Andrew Honda in 1875. In 1884, the record shows that Char Charles Dixon, a native property owner, resides in Ketchikan at the mouth of Ketchikan Creek. August of 1887, William Duncan moved the Sinchian peoples from Fort Simpson, BC, to present day Metlakutla, formerly known as Thomas Village. In 1888, William Duncan facilitates conveyance of land as follows. March of 1888, the historic record indicates a deed by E.W. Perry and his wife to his establishment in his packing home. Then a month later, which is the need for the indicative of fraudulence given the timeline, in April of 1888, the historic record indicates a deed conveyed property by Charlie Dixon to A.W. Perry which is noted to have been signed with an X. Stating the obvious, how can a deed of property possibly be conveyed to a business by its owner before the deed of the property had even been conveyed to the business owner? How can one sell something he does not own? Further, you will see that William Duncan, while often being named for his denominational role in the history of Simshian people, has a much larger hand in the conveyance of needed land within the Ketchikan Gateway Borough. 
In fact, he is repeatedly reported as the justice of the peace for the District of Alaska. Throughout the 1890s, Kajikan went through a rapid colonial evolution, influenced by immigration for the purpose of mining, fishing, and business endeavor. Mining was remarkably effective and well accumulated. That the Kajikan deed indexes show single mining claims priced in the millions. This is almost unthinkable in the context of the 1890s. Let that sink in. While native property owners, while native properties were being conveyed as low as one dollar, their white counterparts were already making millions in the 1890s. The explosion of mining in Southwest Alaska is also pinnacle in the roots of tourism. In fact, Mike Martin, Ketchikan's first self-appointed mayor, built hotels to keep up with the rapid increase in visitors during the time. The timeline shows that in 1891, Metlick officially gained federal reservation status. November 1892, Thomas Packing Co., owned by A.W. Barry, is conveyed to George Clark and Mike Martin. But in the same year, Clark is said to have, quote, gotten into some trouble. And his portion of the property is conveyed to H.C. Strong. But then a month later, December 1892, the day the deed is conveyed back once again to Clark and Martin. 1894, Village is established. 1898, uh, duplicate giant raised. And in the same year, Clark and Martin built a hotel to accommodate for the rapid population increase of prospectors as well as visitors. 1899, several buildings and the work are constructed. And each, and each story and G. Dickinson uh, arriving from Japan as the first doctors in the first city. This is notable because reported history shows that these two doctors have been elicited, have been eliciting drugs to native residents as far as Saxon without the pretense of necessity of putting copious amounts of morphine and opiate into ch children. The birth of the 20th century brought with a rapid evolution of Kevin. In 1900, the first full-size cannery was built by Fidelgo Packing Co., managed by George Brunsicle. February of 1900, Strong and White and Strong and White and Martin conveyed the side uh, payment to be made to Puget Sound National Bank in Seattle, Washington. July of 1900, a Chicago white citizen petitioned to incorporate Ketchikan as an official town. August of 1900, Ketchikan is officially declared as Ketchikan town site. And the same year, Mark, Martin Sutter and Strong filed a lawsuit against the APA, Alaska Packers Association. Um, and in 1901, Ketchikan and the APA um, have a record of encroaching upon Sutter's uh, plain territory. In 1902, uh, Chief Johnson's poll is raised. November of 1902, Heckman wins in the Court of Appeals. And 1902, same year, um, the Sawmill Company and the Ballgrounds can compete for littoral and upland possessions. March of 1903, the City Council orders body houses uh, to move from Newtown to Indian Town. March of 1903, the ball team has a survey made. So the Sawmill Company has a baseball team, right? And he kind of organizes this baseball team to go against native property owners and say, hey, we'll, we'll play a game of ball, like right down on the top class. And uh, they were using that to say, if you lose, you know, we get your property. Which is extremely fraudulent, completely unheard of. And every time I see those commercials now um, on YouTube, it just annoys me because <laughs> it's just not something to be proud of. Um, March of 1903, the city council partners, oh, I the ball team has surveyed me and then I put the flat and field notes as official record. In 1903, same year, um, all teams from Block 18 transferred to JJ Daly, the owner of the sun. Now, the last detail noted is quite extraordinary in terms of how this was done. 
and it is directly associated with, inter it, with the introduction of baseball in Michigan. In a court docket compiled along with the Jenny Lynch case in Ketchikan, it reports that, quote, it appears that from the earliest days that the town had population sufficient to get together a ball team. Um, these grounds have been used as, as ball grounds. Thus, about the year 1902 or 3, we find the baseball team competing with the sawmill company owned by J.J. Bailey for possession of these grounds. The ball team laid a claim to the same, though under what law they sought to hold does not appear, end quote. Following said game without legal merit, seven deeds were fraudulently conveyed to JJ Daly as he self proclaims, all of which were owned by some good people. In the post. This brings us to the 1901 9th Circuit of the Fields, number 9792, Sutter, Strong, and Martin versus Heckman, Miller, and the Eighth Wing. While the case's purpose to dispute the territorial rights between two white business owning men in Ketchikan, testimonies provided by six Tlingit property owners in Ketchikan. Because the case is not purpose to benefit these Native men, their test the testimony from 1900 to 1901 is largely dismissed. However, it is no longer 1901, it's 2023, and now observed with discernment the injustices brought on these men. Their names are Charles Dixon, Thomas George, John Nellis Cake, and Joan Ga, and Kate Lostrom. For the first witness, we establish the background of Charles Dixon. Dixon was born in Ketchikan, August of 1839. Dixon is a member of the Sonia Kwan of Big Box and is recorded under alternate names such as Dickinson and Dixon spelled with an X. On January 5th, 1910, Dixon is listed on the census record, living at dwelling number 21 of In Dixon's testimony, there are some points I want to highlight, and I will demonstrate in the following slide. One, uh, Dixon was made to believe he was only selling one of his three houses he built himself to A.W. Barrett. Uh, oh. uh, two, William Duncan facilitated this deed, conveyance from Dixon to Barrett. Three, several witnesses were in close proximity to Barry when discussing his plans to take Dixon's land from him in a greater capacity than what was bargained. Or they can educate on the cultural practices of land use through property explanations on hunting and fishing. They say establishes his identity and residence for record and with the use of an interpreter. Judge Foote, uh, as the acting attorney, asks, Did you sign that paper referring to exhibit A? which was the deed of land allegedly conveyed to Barry. Dixon replies, that was done. Mr. Duncan wrote that out and with this his name. But when you made that deed, what land or property did you think you were selling to Mr. Barry? Dixon, he thought he was selling the house. It didn't speak of him selling the ground, he says. But was you living in that house when you sold it to Mr. Barry? Dixon, yes, sir. He's always living in it. Living in it while well, you can. But when you sold that house to Mr. Barry, where did you move? Where did you move then? Dixon. He says he sold the house. When he sold the house, he had three all, all, all together. But where are where were they? Dixon, right close to the creek. Then Dixon had decades on the Clinket territorial land use. But did you ever claim any right to hunt the ground back around the beach? Only to yourself, Dixon. He says everyone is hunting back there, but hunting ground descended from his forefathers to him. They were all friends, all friendly hunting there. But they all have the same right to hunt and fish. They go ground there, all the Indians. They say, yes, sir, it belongs to the Tongas Indians. That Following the last question on page 241 of the court docket, where Foot asks, 
How many Indians were there when you buried the came to the country on that beach? Dick said, well, all the Indians around that neighborhood. Also important to know, when Charlie was handed Exhibit A, he was asked whether he could see it, and Charlie responds, no, sir, can't you see how my eyes? And he was cut off. For context, Charlie Dixon was known as, was known as Paper Nose Charlie, claiming that his nose was bitten off, and he used the paper facts and only in its place. Uh, we can draw from that a possible extension of the injury for his eyes. A few questions later, what asks, were they all living? With, were they all living there? Were you told of the log house to bury? They said, yes, sir. There was lots of his friends there. They were making fish at the time. But have all the Indians lived there ever since that time in the same place? They said, yes, sir. There was Indians there always. Interrogation continues on specific numbers and specific lots which would still get a different concept to plaintiffs living in their culture. Then, Foot asks about living Duncan. Foot, ask him if Duncan is a good man or a bad man. Dixon, he says, I don't know. I never lived on this ground. I'm going to you. Foot, ask him if he ever talked to Mr. Duncan about signing the paper. Dixon, yes, sir. He called me. He didn't talk to me. Foot, what did Duncan say to you? Dixon, he just told me to put my name on the paper, but I told him I couldn't. I'm not telling any lies. But no, I know you're not telling any lies, Charlie. Did Duncan, did Duncan tell you what the deed was for? Dixon, yes, sir, about my house. In the final portion of Dixon's testimony, Foot asks, how many Indian houses were there around and near Ketchikan and Ketchikan Creek when Mary built his cannery. Dixon, lots of them, small houses the Indians were living in while working. But ask them who the Indians were working for. Dixon, they were fishing for Mr. Berry, having wood. But what kind of houses, what kind of houses did they live in? Dixon, made out of boards. But why didn't you and your friends object to Berry fishing around and in Dutch Pan Creek? Dixon, why did I be friendly? Throughout Charlie Dixon's testimony, you can discern that he was rather docile in the affect and in presentation. He says more than once that he doesn't want to tell lies, and even points to his face to demonstrate vulnerability with that injury. You will, you will see this concept even more clearly in stark contrast of the testimony of Thomas George, which in my opinion was quite comical. Thomas George clearly utilized sarcasm, which is only further inspired as a further irritation. For the second witness, we established the background of Tommy's story. George is noted in a census record he had before in March of 1856. However, testimony infers being born in Michigan and possibly 18 George belonged to the Tommy Farm and he was married to Fanny George born in May of 1866. The pair had a daughter, Emma, who was born in August of 1891. At the right, you will notice the plan hat worn by Tommy Stewart depicting a sea bear, as well as his grave marker, which shows his death in 1953. In Tommy Stewart's testimony, there, there are additional truths revealed that I want to highlight and demonstrate on the slides. One, forced unpaid labor in building the bridge. Two, my partner charging a bridge toll to the natives who had building it for free. Additionally, using Billy Williams to collect money from the other native property owners. Three, insinuation of Mike Martin murdering Jordan's uncle. Four, Mike Martin running the bootlegging industry, framing the fault around Tom Storch. <laughs> Right from the get, you can tell Judge Foot is familiar with the size in Tommy Stewart's personality. And it appears uh, to attempt entering the interrogatories with a more authoritarian style compared to his interrogatories with Dixon. But now, George, I'll try to make my questions plain. I want you to talk in English when you answer. Where do you live? Interpreter. He said they can't hear well. He wants me to interpret. Referee, go ahead and talk English and talk first rate. After George establishes his identity and residence for the record, 
foot asks, how long have you lived there in Ketchikan, George? Or I lived here till I'm born. Foot, how old are you? George, 39. Foot, where do you live? On what beach? On which side of Ketchikan Creek? George, yes, there's two sides. Other side of my house, my father on one side, me on the other side. A few questions later, Foot asks, were you living in your house near the school there? George, I lived over at my Clark house. When Mr. Bickey came, no white man there. But no white man? George, no. <laughs> Down further, inquiring about his house locations, but asks, where was the other one? George, where my father been living at, that house there. But do you mean the house near the war? George, yes, sir, that work now. But was that a log house or a bark? George, no, a log house, Indian lumber. You can draw from the last two lines that a Judge Foote was asking whether it was a log house or a bark house by means of being trying sending to minimize the validity of his residence. And B, that Thomas George caught on and responded with Indian lumber to remind the court of his work. Further down, Foot asks how many Indians lived on Youngblitz near Ketchikan Creek when they were living there. George, Old Town, maybe a hundred, maybe two hundred. He does Ketchikan all the Indians then. Foot, is Ketchikan an Old Town? George, yes. Foot, was that when Mr. Berry came there with the hundred Indians? George, yes, sir. Further, Foot, how many Indians are living there now? George, same, all time Indians. Now here we get into more into more facts surrounding the bridge being built by the property owners on the creek, like Tony George. Due to a language barrier, you will hear rearranged grammar, but the sentiment is very clear. But when George remarks about Indian collection, he's referring to a coal that Mike Martin would charge for natives to use that bridge um, that they had built themselves. Again, let that notion sink in. Lincoln men in Ketchikan who were responsible for building that bridge were uncompensated, forced to continue working on it, forced to bring back food from hunting and fishing for white men, in addition to feeding themselves and their families, and were not even allowed to use the hunting thing though without paying my Martin to do so. But who built that bridge across Ketchikan Creek? George, Indians, just when a chopper, Mr. Martin came around, he wanted collection for Indians. Indians got hunting, he says, and fishing and half and half collection for white men. Indians <laughs> took up collection for Mr. Martin. But yeah, the Indians built a part of the bridge before Mr. Martin? George, yes, sir. Well, where was the internet built bridge was built on? George, that's Ketchikan Creek. Indian Bill, that was in half. Well, Mr. Martin, he very Indian question. Indian Bill went to no time to go across the creek. He says he's got to have money yet no collection. Mr. Martin, you know, let's go to the bridge. After one man, he asked, Where's that money? I don't know across. But then the Indian paid him money. That was Mr. Martin to build that bridge with. George, yes, sir. But was it the Indians on this side of the creek that paid money to Martin? George, both sides Indians. When they recalled George the following day, he indicated that he has met his limit on speaking English, but the court does not allow him to speak in his language. Martin translating for him, he's got through talking with the whites and he don't want to talk English anymore. Referee, you talk good English, George, there's no reason why you can't go ahead. Foot continues on with the questioning, and a few questions down, he asks, was the collection that the Indians paid in for the bridge, was that money spent for anything but the bridge, George? George, no, sir, all in the bridge. But did you ever hear of that money being spent for any other house or schoolhouse or anything else? George, no, sir, that time no schoolhouse here. But who cut down the trees along each side of the creek and the underbrush and made the trails? George Andrew. But is Andrew an Indian man? George, yes. Then Judge Lynn comes in for cross examination and asks, Did you ever live at George Zenley? 
After clarification, George responds, yes, sir, I live there. When? How long ago did you stay there? George, oh, a long time ago. My uncle, he's at George's neck. He's dead now. Martin knows all about them. When? Martin knows you live there, doesn't he? Notice how Tommy's story reveals to the court that Mike Martin murdered his uncle and Judge Lynn during cross examination does not address him, but rather glosses over to focus on the fact that George used to have a residence there and instead of using past tense, even though George said it was a long time ago, Judge Lynn insinuates current tense using George's language barrier against him to falsely prove that he does not, in fact, reside in the but remember earlier, in both Dixon and George's testimony, it was made clear that Plinkett Pleasants commonly had multiple properties within the same vicinity. Very quickly, Judge Wynn continues to discredit the witness. And if you pay close attention, you will evidence the similarity in how law enforcement uses the particular tactic even today. Wynn continues. Mr. Martin also knows that you lived over there and you made hoochie do and brought it over to fetch you by himself. <laughs> Jordan goes there. When didn't you go away from fetch and stay away for a long time to keep away from the custom house officials and to keep them from arresting you for making hoochie do and selling to Indians? Jordan goes there. And for uh, context, this guy right here, circle, that is Mike Martin. When and did the custom health officers take the Lucino away from you? Or tell them to just eat it in the store? When who, Mr. Marty? George, yes, sir. In Mexican, we meet Luno Lucino. He gave me and three other men. His partners gave me all Thomas for money in the store. So now we have against corruption by Mike Marty once again. In addition to her, Marvin was running the food lady industry in the kitchen. But giving it to Thomas George, framing it him as the culprit. When they gave it to you in the store, George, yes, sir. When and then you went and sold it to the Indians, is that it? George, no, sir. When asked to be put clarified the questions with, you say Mr. Martin gave you whiskey, what were you going to do with all that whiskey? Drink it yourself? George, yes, sir, all myself. When? <laughs> then the customs officer caught you with the whiskey and you ran away from catching can and stayed a long time, didn't you, George? George. No, sir. When he continues to try to stun George, but George reiterates over and over that what Wynn was insinuating was not the case at all. When what Indians paid money to help build that bridge across the Chicken Creek? George, all Indians, that didn't be in here now. When did you pay anything? George, I helped with my hands. When you helped work? George, yes, work post. I use no, no collection. He go to walk over. When you worked, no money but work. George, if you work. Now, this is where you can see further frustration coming from George. It's when he grows in his aggression with interrogation. When, what other Indians now, give me the names, pay money to build that bridge. Give me the names of a solitary Indian, will you? Give the names. What do you call them? George, while well, I show you, I'm mistaken once. When? Give me the names. That's all I want. George Wall, Johnson won. When? How do you know that Johnson gave you money to help build that bridge? George, no, I see him. When? Who did he give that money to? George, Billy Williams. Mr. Martin made false Billy Williams. When he gave the money to an Indian by the name of Billy Williams? George, yes, sir, Mr. Martin made false. When did Billy Williams work for Mike? George, yes, sir. When and, and Johnson gave money to Billy Williams? George, yes, sir. When name another now that gave money to that bridge? George, George Andrews. When continues to ask how Thomas George knows, and he responds that he witnessed all. What we can conclude from this information is that Martin was using Billy Williams 
as another contingent resident who has a bond to collect a fee or tax rather from other native property owners on the pre and high flex and continue building the bridge. Not only did they have to pay to use it, but they had to pay for its construction that they were largely doing themselves for free. Now, when it goes into further discussion of the place out at George's Inlet where George's uncle died. When did you ever have a house down at George's Inlet? George, yes, sir. When who did you sell it to? George, nobody. When you got it yet? George, no, we burned up fire. When how long ago did you have that house at George's Inlet? George, long time before catch can. When you lived down there in a house before catch can, George, all the time. I saw very fish in my creek. When you lived down at George's Inlet in a house and sold the fish a long time ago before there was any catch a can, and you sold fish to who? George, before Mr. Berry, I sold fish to Mr. Hackman. When, how long ago was the house burned up at George's Inlet? George, well, my house burned up seven years. A couple questions later, and my genius begins to get heated and pretty comical. When asked how long ago was it, there was 200 Indians at Country Camp, George. George, we held that yesterday. When? Yeah, how long ago had that been? George, well, you know how long Indians live here, you know that? When? Well, I'm asking you. George, I asked you how long Indians live here. <laughs> When now hold on, I asked you how long ago it was that 200 Indians lived at Happy Cannon. You said yesterday there was 200 Indians there at one time. How long ago was it? George, well, before Mr. Barry, lots of Indians. When well, you said he was 39 years old, George, and something took place seven years ago. Now I want to ask you how many years ago it was that 200 Indians living at Ketchikan. Now just answer the question, George. At this point, the two kind of go back and forth with the same regurgitation of questioning before Wynn changes the subject, asking, Why is it, George, that you didn't have any totem poles over in Ketchikan if that was an Indian village? People have totem poles at their villages, don't they? George, yes, sir, all the time. When, why didn't you build over at Ketchikan, George? George, wintertime. Old Tom gets lots of totem poles. Fish time, catch a can. White man call that catch can. You call that catch can, you know? When you know, George, Indian call that catch can. The way in which George poses this question to provide a concern himself here was extremely intelligent, tactful, and rather comedic to prove that when who is presenting himself quite pompously is an actuality just fair than. When? Well, the Indians live down in Old Tonkidus and they just go up and catch a can of fish and they have their totem poles down in Tonkidus. Is that right? George, well, totem poles all old. Indians use logs. Now we now we use logs to make stone. Mr. Martin is even set. And this is uh Hefman right here. There's a good picture of him circle. Also getting back to my When? Well, that's what I wanted to know, George. Have they got Tony pulled down at Tongas, the Indians, and they all come up to Rainbow and do their fish and they didn't build totem poles at Rainbow. I should say catch a can at home. George, who me? When? No, no, only Indians. George, no. When? Why is it, George? They didn't buy, they didn't build a totem pole to catch a can. George, well, Indians buy no salmon as white men buy. You know, you take property just you take. Indians long time take to place. One live houses and one through catch a can just live houses too. Now, now all the same Rainbow, just same Juno, just same Sitka. You ask this man here, they take town all time Indians. What George does here is quite powerful. When he says Indians take two towns, he means that they build communities together and ownership is not seen in the same way as Clinkett's homogenated and collective society. 
When George says, you know, you take property, just be take, and says, just say rainbow and you know, and so on. He is educating the court that Clinton peoples are very much aware of partaking of their communities. He concludes his testimony by verifying that no one told him what to say, and he can all guess that George is like far away from the authenticity. For the third witness, we introduce the background of John House. John was born on July 1857 of the time of Juan Ben Petty's people or Starter's House. He was the son of George and Beth Betsy, now asleep, and is found under multiple name alternates and census records, which you can see on the slide. John married Marion Cadet, uh, who was the daughter of Chief Maha. The pair had three children together, George, James, and Marion. When John passed away, Mary then married William Evans Kennedy, who took her as his second wife after Lucy. When Mary passed away, William Kennedy raised George and James on his own, but Mary was sent off to boarding school, and what happened to her is a mystery. She is not the Mary Kennedy whose grave was discovered at Harlem for the day his life was stolen. After John now escaped, establishes his identity and residence, Judge Hood asks several questions about how he escaped, familial ties to the land in such a man. He replies, I was living down there with my grandfather's. He told me before he was dead, to which counsel objected to his hearsay. But the translator continues, he don't know for how many years he was then a man now. The time he was dead five years ago, referring to Chief Charlie Nama, my grandfather. I heard for what was told me, and what he told me, I know very well about each man. But how many Indians live along each side of the creek close to the sand? Now, all those houses belong to Indians. Now, I don't know for how many in it, and these ones I don't count it. But about how many Indians now? No, okay. This one for belongs to one man, and they live four with him to stay in there. The one for about John's house for about five with him, and one for four, this one. There's lots of them down there for the whole winter, Indians. When Hood brings up the bridge, he asks, when did you fix that bridge? How long ago? That was me. Oh, not very long. We fixed posts down there. And we collected both of the money to buy some lumber. You know, we give to Mr. Martin's Indian. He collected it. After we go into hunt, and after we come back from hunt, we all go to catch a can. And we made that bridge down there. But did the Indians who built the house down near the creek, did you pay any money for that land? That was me. No. But who owns the land on or near the sand there on each side of the creek? This last question was objected to, stating that that is the question to be decided by this litigation, it calls for the conclusion of the witness. What we learn from this testimony here so far is that you know, state confirms the prior testimony of Thomas Ford that money was indeed collected from the property owners to Mike Martin for the bridge, but also that they had to build it themselves. His testimony also confirms that there were indeed many native property owners on the creek and around the Thailands. What the objection to the testimony confirms is that all such testimony of native property holdings is legally relevant in the eyes of the court because stated they believe themselves to be the ultimate jurisdiction in deciding whether or not they are living there. During cross-examination, Judge Lynn, asked, Judge Lynn first asks, <laughs> um, During cross-examination, Judge Lynn first asks, John, you're kind of an agitator down there, kind of a leader, that is, um, and do a good deal of talking about the Indians, ought to have this thing and ought to have that thing. Kind of the chief. You're kind of the chief, like a muck of muck man among the Indians. Now, answer. 
you know what maybe a chief is, don't you? Yes. Wait, aren't you some kind of chief among the Indians? Tell him, tell him to do things and so on. That was baby. Wait, now you remember when they had a meeting John down there, don't you? These same Indians who were living from along those houses next to the creek there. Mr. Martin was at that meeting, and a high lawyer, a big smooth faced fellow, and it was talked over about whether or not Mr. Martin would permit the Indians to live down there. And it was agreed the Indians could should stay there, and Martin and Clark said they could stay there. You remember that, don't you? He was at that meeting, weren't you? Can you get a deed from that man, Martin, where your house is on Ketchikan Creek? Get a paper from this man, Martin. Referee. Did Mr. Martin give, give you a school paper? That was eight. Yes. When? What for? That was eight. Well, those paper asked for a thing. It belongs for a judge in Juno to another man in Sitka. I don't understand about those paper. See, I don't understand very much of this deed. When you go and see Mike Martin, didn't you? And he go and show you where to stay at the house, where your house is, and you get paper, and that paper put on record now, isn't it? That was paper. Yes. When you know these Indians wanted to live down there in Pinchican Creek, he go up and see Mike Martin, and Grant was there, and some other white men, and lots of Indians two or three years ago. They go and see land and they talk and you talk and Mr. Mark and Mike Martin talk and he tell you and the other Indians he let them live there. He didn't want to disturb them, just let them live. And afterwards he gave you a deed. You remember that? I know he gave me a deed, but I don't know what to do with that. When do you know anything about this meeting I asked you about? That was okay. No, sir. When wasn't you at the end? That was me. No. When at the schoolhouse, were you there with lost Indians and white men for Grant? That was me. Yes. When, yes, and some white people were there. And this man watched you at the meeting when they were all talking about houses and lands and saw you there. This back and forth banter continues for several more interrogatories until they become frustrated, at which point they recall George to the stand and co-testify with the now state. When now George, she would ask him if he and some white people and a lot of Indians can have a meeting at the schoolhouse two or three years ago and talk over about whether Martin was going to put them off the land or let them stay there. George, we didn't go to that meeting. When asked where he was ever at the meeting in that schoolhouse in which it was talked over with the Indians as to whether or not they was going to live down there in the creek or whether Martin was going to put them off. George, he said this winter he went to one of them, the games there. They had made up a collection for some money to pay some lawyers this winter. That's last winter. When asked him what, ask him what lawyer it was they had made up the money to pay, George Ingersoll. When now I want him to answer yes or no, whether or not he was ever at a meeting in this schoolhouse he speaks about some two or three years ago, for any time in which he was talked over about uh, among the Indians and white people as to whether or not the Indians were still going to continue living in, in Ketchikan or Ketchikan Creek, or whether Martin was going to go on. George, well, he said no, we didn't go. When now, John, have you got a place at Tongas? A place down at Tongas, too? You understand me, sir. A house down at Tongas? Say, John, look at me now. You understand me perfectly. Have you got a house down at Tongas? You know, where that little town at Tongas is, don't you? That was okay. Yes, sir. When have you, have you a house down there? That was okay. No. When? They have got totem poles down at Tongas, haven't they? You know where totem pole is. No, I don't understand what it is. When don't you know that you made some the totem poles yourself and sold them small ones about that one? Have you done that yourself? That was okay. Well, interpreters all right with me. I'm gonna tell the truth. Referee. Didn't you make little totem poles, tell other people, tourists, and make them with a knife? That was 
What is it for? I don't know. I don't know what it is to talk for in England. When John, you know what these big, tall poles are, bear spades and eagle spades, and they all cut and they're all cut like that. No. Oh yes, yes, sir. When yes, yes, God bless you. You and I agree for once, John. You call them those totem poles, don't you? That was Kate. Oh yes, I understand for you all. Referee, you have made that, John. That was Katie. Yes, sometimes I make it. When are there any totem poles that catch cannon, big ones? That was Katie. Yes, one on each side, and there are lots of catch cannon island. As you can gather from the tone of this part of the interrupt, interrogation, Judge Wynn was getting increasingly angry toward, jo toward John's misunderstandings due to a language barrier, but became equally angry toward the request of an interpreter. This absurd systemic oppression certainly played a role in the judge and jury's response to the matter. In addition to the existing influence of an era which, in which it was common to expressly discriminate against non-white populations and generally view non-white persons as inferior and intellectually less capable than their white counterparts. When have you any dead people buried in your homes there at Kajapan? That was paper. Yes, sir. Now a lot of people get this buried there now. This concludes John O'Kate's testimony and what has in and what that last question and answer revealed is ultimately a sad truth that country can be dismissed and homes were developed upon the same area of grounds, whether known or unknown, as to which specific law portions. The prevention of this occurring action uh, would have been not only communication with native property owners, but most importantly, a general respect to comprehend the culture and practices of those outside their own. Another interesting piece of information that we acquired through now state testimony is that Charles Ingersoll was the attorney who made a reference for able to secure upon accruing enough funding. This fact is particularly critical in unraveling this historic truth because Ingersoll was, adversely, legally representing Ketchikan's mayor and city council to officially incorporate Ketchikan town site in July of 1900. He was the one that filed that petition in which the grounds of the petition were solely to benefit white residents, signed by 60, 60 white residents, and absent of any voice by country camps first people still residing on the land. This conflict of interest emphatically demonstrates the prejudice imposed on Native persons utilizing this available resource as legal representation. In a modern context, this would be prohibited as well as that uh, as well as set precedents for legal consequence. Ultimately, now was state's testimony affirmed that Charles Charlie Nixon and Thomas George in several key points, including general residency, unpaid forced labor, and building the bridge, a disregard of the presence of sacred burial grounds, unmerited tax or fee collection paid to my party. And the conflicting interest of the secured legal representation of Charles Ingersoll by Native residents fighting to keep their land, while Ingersoll was simultaneously representing Ketchikan City Council and white residents to incorporate the town absent of the procurement of Native property. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. For the fourth witness, we introduce the background of Andrew Anita. Um, also translated as Andrew on the point. Andrew was born in 1875 and belongs to the Tontaquan. It is in, as indicated by a 1900 city of Saxon census. Andrew was married to Stephen on dog, whose birth, date of birth is reported to be February 1882, all of the Tontaquan. Neither Stephen or Andrew were found in the 1910 census, nor from their death case. Them. It is a mystery what happened to Andrew and Susan after this court proceeding. In Andrew's testimony, there are proofs revealed that I want to highlight, demonstrating the following signs. One, specific locations of native property holders around the Freedom Pipelines. 
to affirming that country can natives built and paid for the bridge while also being ordered to pay my board to use it. And three, Ketchikan natives are indeed buried right in downtown Ketchikan in addition to the one minute guidance. After Andrew establishes his identity and residence for the record and clarifies that he was in fact in, born in Ketchikan and lived in on his life, Judge Foote asks how many houses owned by natives were in Ketchikan when Mary arrived in Ketchikan, and Andrew responds, there must be about somewhere near 100. There aren't many of them, but how many Indians are living there now? Andrew, I found the date houses there besides what has come up and gone away. They left value. These two answers alone are a huge point of concern. If when Mary arrived to Ketchikan in 1887, there were roughly 100 native homes on the creek, and just three years later in 1901, when Andrew testified, there are now only eight homes. That is an incredibly telling piece of evidence that a room full of native residents is not a fluke but purposeful and systemic in nature. But then continues questioning about the work around the creek being done for its development, asking, how was the bridge across the Japan Creek built? Andrew, it was built just the way a bridge should be built. But who built, who built the bridge? I really appreciate all of the sarcasm because it's so present in today. Anytime we speak with elders and I teach you all, you know yourselves. I mean, there's always sarcasm. And so it's just, it's very um, centering and it kind of, it just it makes it that much more real because you have conversations just like that yourself. Um, Andrew, we did. John and I were paying the labor, but. Who do you mean by John? Andrew, Cape Fox John. But is Cape Fox John an Indian? Andrew, he's an Indian. But did, did he live down there when the bridge was built? Andrew, he was there building the bridge with me. But who used that bridge most? Andrew, we used the bridge. We collected the money and gave it to Mr. Martin. But did you ever pay any money for the land where your houses are? The Indian houses? Andrew, no. Joe's foot asked further questions about the exact location of his house as well as the houses of all the other native property owners around the creek and high flats. Andrew tells him that Johnny's house is the first from the bridge, then William's house, then his, and that the tide comes up right under his steps. He also said the house in between Willie's and his house are, quote, some old Indians living in there, very old. But who owns the fourth house from the creek? Andrew, that's my house. But who owns the fifth house from the creek? Andrew, Joplin, an Indian. But who owns the sixth house from the creek? Andrew, Kate Fox, Brown. But who owns the first house on the opposite side of the creek? Andrew Johnson, an Indian. But who owns the fourth house from the creek on that same side? Andrew, Mrs. Wilson, and it's an Indian woman. <laughs> Judge Foot asks him if the map shows good at that country down there, at which point it is significant that this question was objected to on the grounds that, quote, the witness has not shown himself qualified and has shown that he is perfectly unfamiliar with drawings. End quote. This is certainly contradictory to the last several questions where Andrew was capable of testifying the exact locations of specific names native residents around the creek, which poses the question why? What reason would Mary have for blatant disregard for Andrew's intellect as a native property owner, bridge builder, and recollection of every neighbor around his residence? A few questions later, Foot asks, Are there any Indians buried there where the houses are? Andrew, when, Indian, when any Indians die there in the summertime, they have them laid away for a while. And when they go back to winter quarters, they take dead ones along down there and bury them there. 
But are there any gravestones on Indian graves just across Tongas Narrows? Andrew, yes. But are they the dead of the same people who live here in the creek before they die? Are they the dead of the same people? And did they live near the creek? Andrew, across from the town, they're taking them there now. But how far away is that burying ground? Andrew, as far as for me to house down there on the point, about that far, indicating Chief Johnson. We now look right down the ground, but again, what? Doug Lynn then enters the cross examination. When you have a nice house built down there on the beach, have you? Andrew, yes, sir. <coughs> when is it better than the house you had in that look at them? Andrew, I've got a, I've got a good lumber right now. It's my best house. Yeah, like when you still have a house in that look at them, still in and it burned up there. I've got it now. When have you known my garden and have you treated you well? And I know them, so it's treated me well. When when did your house over in Mount Lakeville burn down? Andrew, what long has it been she had to move down there to Mount Lakeville and your house burned down there? When you have a wife and children? Andrew, my other wife, I have children with her. Or the other one. When did your wife live with you in the same house in the at Met with Ella when Mr. Duncan was there? Andrew, about three years. When did you ever live with the Sinchian tribe with my Indians over at BC before they went to Met with Ella? Andrew, no, sir. When when you went to Met with Ella, when where did you go? Andrew, from Texas. When while you lived in Old Tongas, didn't you take didn't you used to go up to Pejacan and come south with Charlie Gibson? Andrew, yes, sir. I always went from one place to the other. When and on this ground you made the about Pejacan, there is for hunting ground, did you? Andrew, my hunting ground is on the other side of Fort Chester. When did you ever sell the old house you used to live in in Old Tongas? Andrew, no, sir. When what house was it you used to live in at Old Tongas? And your my poor focus. Several questions and answers echo that by Judge Foot until when asks, did any did other Indians decide yourself come up to Old Tongas and go hunting in the summer from Michigan? Andrew, one man would hunt around there and then he would go somewhere else, and then another would be hunting up there. When did you claim that this land around Ketchikan as a hunting ground? Andrew, three persons hunted around there. One on that above the north side of the creek, and one on the south side. And that's Thomas George up there on the back part of the mountains. When, how many years has it been? Or how long has you, your family, or the group of people come over from Ketla Ket Ket to Ketchikan? That is, to build the house you're in now. Andrew, since it's been Janet, we only stopped moving to Port Chester that same winter I built my house in Michigan. When asked another clarifying question to which Andrew's respond, to which Andrew responds four years. Judge what returns for redirect and asks, Do you know when the ferry came to catch again? Andrew I spoke. This marks the end of Andrew's testimony, and we can conclude, we can conclude. Repeated themes of former testimony in terms of arguably unjustifiable objections to the witness with the intention of discrediting him. However, we clearly evidence from Andrew's responses that he is more than capable of informing the court as to specific residential facts about Michigan, as well as reaffirming cultural life sustaining practices among Native people. For the fifth witness, we introduced Johnson, or rather the plain George Johnson, born November of 1863 of the Tonga Tonga Star Starling House. We clarified that this is that this Johnson is in fact the plain, as he informs us in his testimony that he's got a house where Mrs. Kate Swanson is. In the 1910 census record of January 5th, 1910. George Johnson is listed right next to 
Kate Swanson on the sheets of the team. Johnson was married to Lucy Johnson, born November 1858 of Asanya Kwan, and he passed away in 1938, the same year the federal living was Johnson's testimony is significantly shorter than that of former uh, native witnesses called the stand, which may for reasoning to be probable conclusion and findings by Judge Foote and Judge Lynn as to what they were looking for, as well as innumerable accounts of discrediting native witnesses thus far. But how old are you, Johnson? Johnson, I'm pretty old. <laughs> Go ahead. Johnson catch again my turn. But how long have you lived there? Johnson from a child. I was there before Mr. Berry came there. And two years after Mr. Berry built the cannery, or we've been off somewhere. And then two years later he came back again. But did you have a house there near the creek when Mr. Berry came to the country? Johnson, yes, sir. I had a house there before Mary came. How for Ms. Wilson and Ms. Swanson is living in now, and then another house for the schoolhouse is in now. Important to note the schoolhouse reference here during this time is on Main Street. But did you sell that house, either one or both of them, to anyone at any time? Johnson, no, sir, I didn't sell it to any white man. <laughs> Johnson's response here uh, is purposeful. Because the law states that once native property is exchanged to non natives, the land that uh, can no longer be considered under the defined reservation. But were your houses near the creek? Johnson, yes, sir. And I've got a house on the other side of the creek. But how close to that creek about Johnson? It's right close to his house on the creek where the creek is running. Well, well how close to the high tide is your house? Johnson, the high comes right up under the house. But how long, how long have you lived in that house, Johnson? Johnson, I've lived in that house before Barry came two years after Mr. Barry took the place, and he hasn't lived there since. But were there any other Indians who had houses next to the creek before Barry came? Johnson, no, it was only two strides that lived there. But about how many people were living there near the creek? Uh, when Barry came to the country, Johnson, there was a good many there. But about how many houses were there on both sides of the creek when Barry first came to the country? Johnson, long ago, there were five houses on this side of the creek and the upper side, and eight houses on the other side, the lower side of the creek. But was that before Mr. Barry, before Barry had come to the country? Johnson, it was before Barry and Gunn. But are there any human houses there yet? Johnson, the foundations and some of the posts are there yet. But are there any houses, Indian houses near the creek now? Johnson, there are houses there as many as there were before and even more than there ever was before. But who occupies those houses now? Johnson, there's nobody in them now. They're all done working and hunting and hunting and fishing and doing other things. But are you living there now? When you came up to Juno? Johnson, yes, sir. I came up here from my house. But um, was there any other Indians living there before you came to Juno? Johnson, yes, sir. There were Indians there. But about how long have they been living there? Those that live there and are living there now. John said they lived there for quite a while now. But several years? John said a good many years they lived there. But did you pay anything to any man for the house where you live? John said, I didn't buy it from nobody. It was my own grounds. And I built my house on it. Hello. But have the trees and ropes cut away from the ground or the creek? Johnson, yes, sir. They were slapped away by the Thomas Indians. No white I men, though. But how do the Indians get across the creek now? Johnson, there's a bridge. We go across the bridge. But who built the bridge? Johnson, I was down at the NASA when they built that bridge. Judge Lynn asked, what place is that? 
John's an answer down near Fort Simpson. But does he know anything about how that bridge was built or who built it? John said they told me about how it was built. Judge Wynn again interprets or interjects. Uh, I need to strike out the answer. Who makes use of that bridge across the Chicken Creek? <laughs> we will admit that the public use it. Johnson, the Tongas, why do people use that bridge? When Wynn enters for cross examination, he asks, Did you ever have a house at the Pella or Tongas? Johnson, no, sir, only the Chicken. When did you ever have a house on that place at uh oh uh, uh old Tongas? What Wynn is trying to pronounce is uh, which is the word for Tongas Island Village and translates to place of the cottonwoods. Johnson, I've got a house that place you speak of, Kotsukuka, talking him at Old Tongas, but but not at Old Tongas. When did you ever use it? Johnson, yes, sir, I used it long ago. When have you got a wife and any boys or girls? Johnson, yes, sir. I've got a wife and children, and some of them are in the city school. When did your wife and children live with you and go to the club? Johnson, yes, sir. I lived with them there. When did you know William Duncan at Lakeva? Johnson, I don't know a man by the name of William Duncan. When do you know that big tiny man down there at Lakeva or Port Chester? Johnson, yes, sir. I know Duncan. I always perform with catch fish for Duncan, do you? Johnson, yes, sir, catch salmon. When do you know this man, Mike Martin? Johnson, yes, I know him. When is there any big box Indians living at Ketchikan? Johnson, yes, but they're living below down in Saxony. When, where did the Thomas Indians come from? What place in old times, way back yonder, from what village, what place? Johnson, there was always Thomas tribe, and then there was some, and they, they were some and emigrated here from here and lived among them, and that's what made Thomas tribe. When emigrated from here, up in Juno, do you mean? Johnson, from up here, yes, sir. When I mean, when you had a big house 20 or 30 years ago, it was kind of a tidy among the Indians. Where did the Indians live? With you, Johnson. Down at Kotuka, down at Kotuka, John Wayne. When you were kind of a cheap or tiny Indians used to go off at different places and hunt and fish in the season and then come back to your place during the winter, Johnson. Yes, sir. The Indians go, go around hunting all over, up the mountains and around. And when they get through, they go back. Pass slave. <laughs> Lastly, book reader X. How long since you have used that old house at the place you call Kodukuka? Johnson, I think it's about 30 years. I never use it anymore. Black but not least, we introduce the sixth and final witness, Kate Fox John. Kate Fox John was born December 1842 of a song of Quan Take Lady. He is found in both the 1900 and 1910 Kansas census records. And Fox John was married three times, once to Mary C. John, born in 1857, and had a son, Peter H. John, some records adding S to his last name as John's, who was born in 1879 and passed in 1946. He was also married to Naku P. and Shayette John, born in 1848 and had a daughter, Annie John Brown. Born in 1874. Lastly, he was married to Katie St. John, born in 1860, and had a daughter of John Brown, born in 1882, and passed in 1934. And Peter C. John, born in 1885, and passed in 1929, a year after his mother. Kate Fox John passed away in 1935 in Washington State. It is not clear what he passed of that this death record is not accessible. But where do you live? John, before the white men came to the country, Kate Fox is my place. But, well, I'll put it this way. Where do you live now? John, catch a hand. 
but as the same repeating question that we did the former witnesses to clarify John's residence several questions later but asks who built the bridge John the whites and the Indians built it and I helped to build it too but state to the court how that bridge was first started John we had quite a talk with council over it before we done anything toward the bridge and after we had that we started to build on it of course, I helped too and told them they better build a post slanting so they would lean toward the bridge. And they built it as far as the creek and uh, didn't go any further than it. But how was the bridge finished after they built as far as the creek? John, I left them just when they got to the creek. I helped them build it with the creek to the creek and then left them. And when I came back, they told me the white was the train. I was only there when they were setting posts. But how long ago, um, after, how long after you had built that part of the bridge out to the water was it finished? John, about a year had gone by before it was finished. And then uh, the whites didn't finish it after they got across the other side of the creek. And the Indians had to finish it and join the bridge with the land on the opposite side. I helped to finish it. But as someone who's not fishing in Cape Cod, John notes that his ancestors, grandfather, and uncle he used to spear their own beach in front of the Indian houses, and that he, used to, he speared there himself. But did your people ever catch fish there to smoke? John, what do you think we had in those days? Sugar? We had salmon. That's what we tried them for. <laughs> but did you ever have to pay for the right to fish there? John, no. But did you ever have to pay anything for the land your house is on? John, no. Did you ever hear of anybody paying for his father's property to go and build a house on it? It was my father's property that he built a house on. When Mr. Cross asking, you know, you used to be the big tiny key of all the people you get around Cape Cox. John, my uncle was the big chief, and when he died, he put me in it. When, how many years were you the tiny of the Fox when you had in Cape Fox country? John, it was about 54 years. When, did the Cape Fox Indians that, uh, that you was a tiny or chief of, used to hunt all around over that country at Cape Fox and we'd go up the mountains and hunt and you, uh, and go to the stream and catch fish and then come back to your big house and hunt and home in the winter. John, yes, sir. They used to all go over there. They would go and get this kind of lot bark and they would take it and try to sap. And go up the mountains and then go from there to the same creeks. Each one had their own place. Each family had their creek. And they dried the salmon and they went back home again. When wasn't that the name of the mill, that village Cave Fox? And isn't that the name, the same which they called the new Cave Fox John? John. Yes, they're the ones calling me Foster. When don't you know my partner too? John, yes, I know my partner. When when you didn't my partner need a tweak after you after your name and call it Kate Fox John's Chuck? John, I know it. When how old are you now, John? John, 64 years old. When isn't you kind of a tidy property holder now and got a big house at K Fox where you used to live when you was a chief and also when K Fox John stuff? John, yes, sir. And there's one of the great man one at K Fox. When didn't Mike Martin tell you he didn't care? You could live down there on his land and Mike Mike wouldn't make you any more trouble about you having a house on the base of Ketchikan Creek. But you and Mike are friendly and Mike wouldn't bother you. John, no, sir. Mike Martin didn't ever say that to me. I went there on my own accord and I built the house on my own account. But reader X, you say you had a house at Cape Fox and a house on the creek. What creek do you mean? John, I think that must be the creek they named it, the they named after me and the, and the house I got. But is that the creek to catch again? John, no, sir. But well, have you had have you a house near the creek at Ketchikan? Yes, sir. I have a house near the creek at Ketchikan. But at which house do you call your home? John, I call Ketchikan my home, where I live now and all my people know. 
Now that we have concluded all the testimony presented by the plaintiff witnesses and punch can we decode and press the litigation for a fruitful historic record. Examples of such include baseless object objections proposed during questioning and cross-examination, defamatory and racist slander, projections of intellectual capacity without qualifying measure, Framing interrogatories around discrediting the witness by accusations of drinking alcohol. Disregarding testimony in almost its entirety, ruling in favor of an illegitimate transaction of land. Cited on this slide include exacting demonstrations of oppressive litigation. And by those of you interested to observe such on your own report, and I can distribute if anyone would like a positive presentation. In addition to inserted pause for demonstration throughout this presentation. And proving the claims made by Judge Foot and Judge Lynn in their attempts to discredit native witnesses, we observed numerous examples of intellect and speech patterns. Speech patterns presented by the six native witnesses named here prior indicate conversational understanding and intellect to the degree of common understanding. Size comparisons, yes versus no, right versus wrong, true versus fabrication, perceptive of threats, and a moderate use of sarcasm. And I'd like to add a very noticeable degree of humor. Even today, if you were to become close with a plaintiff or even hide out of some shan elder in our community, this tone and humor would be recognizable to you throughout the testimony. The fate of the 1901 case is a known injustice because, as noted before, the case was between two groups of white people and their businesses. So while six Native property owners in Ketchikan testified as to threats to their homes, that testimony was rendered irrelevant because the court never weighed their cases in its final ruling. Ketchikan's growth continued rapid, rapidly as if all that was stated on record didn't exist. 1904 uh, was the first building boom around Sedgwick Street and Creek Street. August of 1905, a reservation is established under the law as, quote, all of the lands in the vicinity of the mouth of Edgingham Creek, which lie between the lands occupied by the nations and the limits of low pine on Thomas Mirrors. That same year, the first courthouse was built where the current federal building is today in 2023. May of 1908, published announcement uh, was made in June on newspaper that Chief Hine, quote, dropped dead in front of his house, end quote. They said nothing further. That was May 2nd, 1908. Um, we can infer that that was Lewis as George had died um, in, the, in 1923, I believe. November of 1910, a letter to Charles Ingersoll from the Department of the Interior defining, quote, what constitutes a possessory right to a lot, end quote, for the Ketchikan town site. In 1912, a published announcement that the body of Johnny Pine was found in Yambier Bay and was to be shipped back to Ketchikan. Same year, the Alaska Native Brotherhood was assembled. June of 1919, Natives of Ketchikan filed a complaint to the city of Ketchikan on property encroachments, and the city then writes to the U.S. Land Office. As noted in the prior slide on August 5, 1905, the Secretary of the Interior made a reservation of lands described as follows all the land in the vicinity of the mountain of Ketchikan Creek, which lie between the lands occupied by the native and the limits of low tide of Thomas Harris. You can observe to the far right of the slide of the plat of such native possessory rights. This includes several properties around Ketchikan Green and behind it around now called Woodland Avenue, Park Avenue, Harris Street, Mickey Way, and Deermount Street. It also includes the entire length of Sedstead and Street, the tide flats, which are now hidden by an outward built board. And all the area which is now the set the family landing. And finally, all of all of Thomas Basin on Indian Street and East Street. Okay. 
even with a legally established federally recognized reservation throughout the vicinity of Hedgehog and the Time Flats, white business owners, especially J.J. Daly, the owner of Hedgehog Sama, continued to put pressure on Hedgehog Native residents, pushing them further and further off the properties. Before long, Natives collectively convened the council in hopes of putting a stop to the perpetual plan of losing their homes. From the 1860s to the 1930s, there's sacred burial grounds uh, that exist on Canaan Island, which were large and intact. You can observe a photo on the right of this slide. May of 1921, the Touch of Canada Townsite Condition Plaque was admitted. January 1923, a proposal by Kajikan natives was approved to erect the Salvation Army building on Thomas Basin. During that same time, it was illegal for native peoples to gather in public. They were not allowed in main dance halls, nor in most restaurants. It was illegal for native peoples to gather. In order to get around those laws, to be able to convene in planning their fight against discrimination, they had to gather under the guise of a religious organization. The only denomination that would approve their proposal to build a hall was the Salvation Army, allowing them to convene for secret business. 1924, Jenny Lynch uh, fights, uh, fights in her case against uh, the city council and the federal government uh, for Daly's encroachment on her deeded land from her uncle, she cut. 1926 to 1929, Juno Alaska Fisherman publication covers Jenny Lynch case and which has reported scandals and crime. June of 1931, a native possession plot is submitted. December of that year, Ketchikan records um, records cite that Jay Daly and Ethel Dempsey, quote, were found dead in an apartment uh, under a suicide pact. March 1933, the draft of the blueprint for the federal building began. 1938, the federal building was drafted. In September that year, the proposed CPP project begins with the USDA Forest Service under Tongass National Forest and Within, and MOAs are signed by AMP officers, Saxon residents, and Clinton elders of high esteem. Also, that same year, an article headlines that Peter Kayan and his crew find a skeleton under the Chief Johnson pole. Um, appeared to be after a DNA analysis of a white man. Um, February of 1939, a memorandum of affidavit is sent to Assistant Secretary of the Department of the Interior supporting the restoration of the peoples. Before we observe the parameters of the US v. Jenny Lynch case, we establish her identity and background. Jenny Lynch was born at Jenny Brendamal. A few family trees of her grandchildren found in the National Archives database to note her as stage return of the Plan. Her birthday is debatable, but between 1866 and 1872, and died definitely May of 1957. Jenny's mother's name was supposedly Ellen, although in her death certificate, it has a question mark after her name. Um, who was a supposedly a sister to Brian, who married a man with the last name Brendable, a logger located near Fort Townsend. Jenny's family traveled back to Ketchikan often as their family had a claim there. She moved to Ketchikan officially upon the news of her uncle, she crying Paul Neal. Jenny married William Evans, and their children were Ellen Evans, Emily Evans, William S. Evans, May Evans Stillstrom, Anna Evans Tracy Theory. James Edwin Evans, Henry William Evans, not to be confused with Henry Ward Evans, Bessie Evans, Ward the Ball, and then she married William Lynch. An expansive documentation of the USBJ Lynch docket states, quote, the tactics used by the Samo people to get possession and control of these tide flats have, seen, have been somewhat varied, but always persistent. At various times, they would drive a few files a little farther over on these grounds and extend their log zone. And they would dump 
Then they would dump slabs in a heap near the mill or yards and thus get possession of a further margin that way. Each that theft seems to have been met with a with, with resentment on the part of the ball team and people generally. But as no particular step meant a total deprivation of the ball grounds, the people took no drastic action. <laughs> One specific instance will, set, will serve to throw, throw some light on the general situation. About two or three years ago, it appears the former manager of the sawmill, Mr. Burkhardt, either for himself personally or for his company, attempted to take possession of some of those high plans on the junction of Mission and Seven Streets. He made a he reported a uh, purchase of certain liquor all rights at the point from a native. One day he had some highly driven there with the apparent intention of building thereon or at least of occupying the ground. That night there was a public indignation meeting of citizens, and though it was a wet and stormy night, a party of citizens, including the mayor of the town, went down and sawed off the piling from a few inches to a foot above the ground. The stumps are still standing there, but no further attempt was ever made to hold possession of that piece of ground. This was about the year 1910. After examining the, the general situation and talking with several members of the Common Council and the Commercial Club, I suggested some of those parties the advisability of pushing, of passing some resolution indicating their views as to the proper way to adjust the matter. As far as I could learn, there was only one sentiment, and that was that the Sano people, aka Education Power of People, should not be allowed to encroach further on the tide lands. But what but before a meeting was held, the Sano horses heard this was going on, and they got their influences. Um, to work, and as a result, there was no resolution passed. Though the matter was discussed by the Common Council, Daly on his part threatened that if any adverse action were taken in response to his consistent aggressive encroachment on native property, he would remove the sawmill from he would remove the sawmill from the town. As far as I can learn, the trend of sentiment after that was that no action should be taken, which would drive the sawmill away. The possessions of the Ketchikan Power Company are located about as shown in the blue here herewith. It will be observed that Mission Street is built entirely over tide lands, <clears throat> built on tiny and land. Um, and at high tide, the water is five or six feet or more under it. Just south of Mission Street and adjoining it, the Sama people have erected a long platform on piling on level with the street. This is no serious inconvenience to the public since it is open access to all, which was used to some extent by the Sama people, and its real object, no doubt, is to hold possession of those lands. For if they can get possession of the land adjoining the street, their possessions will extend to the water. The docket informs, quote, from the letter of J.J. Daly, Exhibit 13, it appears that several titles were taken in the name of H.G. Burkhart and are now so held. These were not looked up by me as I received this letter before leaving town and have no knowledge of that feature of the phone matter before receiving the letter. Abstracts and deeds are submitted here with as follows. Exhibit 7, Bishop Rhoda Ketchikan Alco, conveying certain of the plural rights, supposed, supposed to be a, a pertinent to Lot 1 and Lot 18. Exhibit 8, Lathrop and White to KPC, conveying the plural rights, a pertinent to Lot 2, Lot 18. Exhibit 9, Chief Kind and White to KPC, Lots 3 and 4, Lot 18. Exhibit 10, Brown to KPC, conveying littoral rights, block, uh, block 8, uh, block 18. Exhibit 11, Stanley and Govan to KPC, uh, block 15 of block 17. Exhibit 12, or part to KPC, certain littoral rights. One of these appears to touch block 2 or block 18, second location determined. Before and at the time of the 1905 reservation, lots three and four of block 18 line within the reservation were owned and occupied by Chief Kine and his wife. 
Lot 8 was owned and occupied by the Peter Johnson. Lots 12, 16, 17, 18, and 19 of Lot 17 were owned and occupied by natives. On October 16, 1924, the U.S. files a lawsuit against Jenny Lynch in return for remaining on her property, which was conveyed to her via deed by her uncle, Chief Hyman. Jenny had filed prior complaints and was physically dragged off the property by police officers ordered by the then mayor of Hutchikan, Thomas Tory. Jenny was physically beaten in the street, her clothes torn off, and her deed by her uncle, she kind of reported. The United States court, in its attempts to forcefully remove Jenny from her land, argued that she couldn't prove her relation in any kind. Jenny countered that the court was not acting upon sufficient facts. At the time of Jenny's birth, around 1872, all over her headstone, March 1866, family trees and birth certificates were not issued to natives because natives were not considered citizens. Quote, well, as an affirmative defense to each of the causes of action, defendant Jenny Lynch says, one, that, that it does not state facts sufficient to constitute an action, a cause of action against the defendant. Two, that this court has no jurisdiction over the defendant but for the, of the subject matter of the action, so they're been attempted to be alleged and stated against this defendant. Several new articles in the 1920s, particular, particularly Juno's Alaska Fisherman, published evidence discussing the atrocities of Ketchikan's mayor, the police, the federal government, in their attempts to force natives off their land so that they could illegitimately claim a their property to One 1926 article reports. Quote, some 30 years ago, the white people began to settle here, and from time to time since that day, have pushed the natives farther and farther away until now the Indians are struggling for their last foothold. The attention of the Attorney General is called to the map number one here with and to the location of the Jenny Lynch Tide Land lot described in the complaint in the case of the U.S. of U.S. v. Jenny Lynch. Notice that, it, sorry, um, notice that it lies a quarter of a mile from the navigable waters of Tongass Narrows and behind a large tract claimed by the Sawmill Company, which, convert, which covers the water from, um, on the Tongass Narrow. Notice also that the large area on the south side of Ketchikan Creek is vacant. It's up for several floats, which are fastened along Stedman Street through the use of small boats and has been and has long been used for that class of boats. The complaint is supported by an affidavit of Thomas Tory, the acting mayor of Ketchikan, who says he wants the lynch lot to use for the for the town work. Ketchikan has more uh, property. Excuse me. Ketchikan has more than two miles of forfeit on Tongass Narrows and has never used that Jenny Lynch lot for any other use. Tory's affidavit is without authority and is a fraudulent one. Tory makes no effort and never has to defend the Indian village or their property from the red light or the tenderloin district and never has given aid in the enforcement of the laws where they're so notoriously violated there and is not worthy of any attention or respect in this manner. The red light district lives in this Indian town, having crowded that gentle, inoffensive, and better class of the Indians out with the assistance of this honest leaders who have swindled some of them out, though their titles are yet held by Charles E. Ingersoll, trustee of the United States and the Indians. This is the worst spot in Alaska, and it is on Indian lands, on the tide lands, to serve by the Secretary of the Interior for Indian use. Just the land that Jenny Lynch is on, and only across the street, within a hundred feet of her house, the vendors of narcotics are all reside on this land, the title to which is held by the U.S., the United States property, these poisons and meat, um, Property protects 
excuse me, protects 200 prostitutes, pimps, and their kind who sell bootlegging liquors and narcotics and carry on a school there to spread both in the United States. This uh, to spread these poisons and maintain the most vicious den of crime in Alaska on Indian and Thai land, the title being in the government of the United States. This crime hole on Indian and Thai lands under the control of the U.S. government shelters more criminals and costs the Department of Justice for the, for the suppression of crime uh, than any other place in Alaska. It is the underground station for all of the illicit British Columbia liquors and narcotics that nobody knows open and notorious facts better than the public officials of more funding because you can't do them. Unquote. And then in 1929, the same journal published the results of the case they've been closely tracking for five years, reporting that Judge E. Hill has just cited in five days case arriving in Ketchikan against the claim of Jenny Lynch. She took possession of a banquet law as fought on the west side of Senate Street next to the Salvation Army building and made preparations to build a house their own. The United States District Attorney brought suit to a gesture from the company in the name of the United States. She then proclaimed the tribe man both as a Kedekan Indian as a, and a citizen of the United States. Judge Hill held that on the order of the reservation made by the Secretary of the Interior in 1905, setting aside the Kedekan Titans to the place of uh, for a place for the Indians to land their boats was void because the act of Congress under which it was made did not apply to tide lands. And he further held that Jenny Lynch was not entitled to settle for the tide lands because they were covered by high tides and therefore a part of the navigable, navigable waters of Congress Narrows and cannot lawfully and cannot be lawfully occupied. By any person without the affirmative authority of some act of Congress. He held further, the, further that there is no such act of Congress permitting such occupancy by a citizen of the United States, and decided that she was a trespasser and ordered her to be removed from the lot. He overruled a, con a contrary decision by Judge Jennings in a Duno Thailand case. If that is the law, it seems to follow that every building on Kachikan Thailands is an illegal structure and may be removed at the suit of the United States District Attorney. We hope this case may be appealed and reversed and the possessory rights of the Kachikan Thailands may be held to be lawful and the possessory title held good. Here to the left of the slide, you will notice that the, notice the plot of the blueprint for Kachikan's federal building which began its draft in March of 1933 and completed the following year. This plan was a direct result of the proceedings and ruling of the 1924 to 1929 Jenny Lynch case due to the disregard for and overturning of the conveyance of the federal reservation to find in 1905. The U.S. court went into agreement with the Ketchikan City Council that the Thailands under former Native reservation jurisdiction would be conveyed to public use federal property, whereby the work was built and a federal building erected. The federal building was officially erected in 1938. And in case that wasn't any clearer, the intention of building a wharf and building over the water as opposed to building inward to the land like most places would build, the intention was absolutely to disregard the federal the reservation defined by the federal government for Native people. That was their loophole. We could build out. How can they get to their land? This pattern of land theft under the guise of economic development and government overreach continues for the next few decades. As we know, this was fought against by the honorable works of the Alaska Native Brotherhood and the Alaska Native Sisterhood in partnership with the first Alaska Native and for first Alaska Native and first Cleveland attorney, Mr. William Luke's Paul, as well as Roy and Elizabeth Kravich and many others. 
We celebrate Elizabeth Kravovich Day every year in February and dedicate a theater on the very ground that her ancestors were so rigorously thrown off of just a few years prior to signing the anti discrimination bill into law in 1945. Ironic, isn't it? And then came the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act signed by Richard Nixon December 18, 1971. Prior to the establishment of ANSA, the sustainability of Alaska Native culture was heavily reliant on Aboriginal land claims. Where they were directly correlated with who they are, and as such, place and identity go hand in hand. It makes sense that in taking away so much of who they are, ANSA was essentially the grim reaper of culture itself. Accompanying the recession of a commercial fishing industry, culture politics by Kurt Dombrowski explains that the legislation was framed by two tenets. One, Congress' unwillingness to create new government-to-government -government relations to recognize new Indian territory in Alaska. Two, its need to quickly and finally resolve outstanding land disputes then slowing the development of crude oil resources on the North Slope, and three is the desire for a way of costly social welfare program, a way out of social welfare programs for primarily native, um, primarily native rural Alaska. As Dombrowski points out, the agenda of Congress was no secret, and yet the offer appears so enticing in comparison to the detriment facing native. Alaskan natives, native peoples, as their livelihood was quickly slipping through their fingers, ANSA advertised a promising alternative, including, quote, a cash payment to Alaskan natives of over $980 million and a retention by them of 40 million acres of land. The vast majority of Alaska, however, would be owned by the federal and state government and would have to open up a slew of problems. Alaska Natives soon realized things and dictates the apportionment of what was already right with theirs. Don Browski points out, Ainsa, quote, laid the groundwork for several critical community dynamics and tensions, unquote, emanating from, the, from a corporation framework that decided a woman. ANSA served as a complex blueprint of 13 regional corporations and proportionate village corporations for every village in Alaska. Additionally, the infrastructure involves a definitive web labeling the kind of native a person per the recognition of the federal government. The divisions, shareholding natives and new natives and residents and non-resident shareholders, determines the monies and land each native Alaska, each native Alaskan is entitled to. Accompanying the web is a set of rules that pre predetermine the future. The first being any person born in 1971 should not reap the benefits of the web is a set of rules that, that excuse me, um, may not reap the benefits of the act unless otherwise inherits shares from an independent shareholder, and second, all native exclusive vector off as of 1991, and share their open game. To briefly summarize the agenda, ANSA was set into play the moment greedy legislators got sought cash cow in the North Slope. Alaska Natives were minimized to nothing but an obstacle, which could be easily waved away with a contract of false promises and deceit hiding in fine print. In the Southeast, Legislators drew a financial map for Native Alaskans, instructing them to use allotted funds to pioneer and maintain a timber industry. However, corporations like the Alaska, for example, would allocate funds for equipment but would fall short when in trying to get up and running. Corporations were not supplied with nearly enough capital to launch a profitable enterprise while still using those same funds to keep, well, keep the heat on in their homes to feed their children. As a result, corporations were forced to liquidate shares of the, of the operation bit by bit or completely turn it over to another non-native entity. 
And today, 222.7 million out of Alaska's total 365.5 million acres is owned by the federal government. Alaska is the fourth in the nation and great state for most of the federal government as the biggest state in the country. This tops the nation's overall federal state at 27.1%, and Alaska has seen a difference of not native 9.4% since 1990. If this recurring theme wasn't enough of a glaring injustice, uh, five Alaska Native communities have yet to even receive their ration of crumbs from what belonged to their families since the act was signed in 1971, 52 years ago. Ketchikan is one of them. In February of 1994, a study of five Southeast Alaska communities was prepared by the Institute of Social and Economic Research, University of Alaska Anchorage, for the U.S. Department of Agriculture Forest Service and the U.S. Department of the Interior, Bureau of Land Management and Bureau of Indian Affairs. This study cites under Ketchikan Indian possessions and native town site lands that, quote, when the survey of the Ketchikan town site was approved in 1913, the town site issued beans to all white occupants and to some persons of mixed native white blood. The remaining lots were not deeded, and the subsequent administration of the town site, the government land office, GLO, and a treated undeeded land as native possessions. Later, in the late 1920s, the GLO investigated the status of native occupied lots, including areas near the mouth of Chicana Creek and lots south of the creek that were not included in the original town site. The lots were surveyed, but no deed had been issued from natives as within the town site. Um, excuse me. Of the remaining, of within the town site, including native possessions, many of the lots involved are very valuable. The Department of the Interior investigated the ownership of 33 lots in the native possessions and in 1941 reported that about half. Uh, remained in native ownership and then the rest had passed to whites. There is no further record of, of action on native possessions until 1957 when the when DOI became, began issuing deeds for another 38 lots in the native possessions. That actively continued through the mid late 1960s, but by that time, much of the land is no longer occupied by natives. As you can observe at the right of the slide, a map provided by the Bureau of Land Man Management illustrates Ketchikan's land status. It's highlighted in orange overall, overall the, of downtown Ketchikan from the creek to the tide flats, as well as a few locations around Water Street and Mickens Street, indicate Alaska Native lands patented currently under KCOPS Corporation today. Yet the people of Cape Fox corporations or local Tongass tribe descendants receive royalty of any kind on the multi trillion dollar industry that swallows up all of downtown seven months out of the year. I'm sure, you can guess which one that one is. Today, we can look, today, we look at more than a century long evolution of Pedic and Slinket land. Not only Ketchikan Creek, but all the tide flats where it lies in work and on this basin. We often recollect the, success, uh, the successes of economic development. But did you ever hear the names of those it was stolen from before its presentation? Did you ever see even a glimmer of appreciation on a plaque around town of Carl Dixon or Congress George, the Dominion of the State? Andrew Wan Dog, Lupin Johnson, or Kate Foxstrom, or what about Jenny Lynch? Perhaps a note at the bottom of a misplaced totem pole for the sake of tourism, sure. But do you know where they where we are? Their names and their families are stamped all over Ketchikan. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, Ketchikan, yet those on placards with lengthy commemorations are those who stole everything and filled what they could not steal. This is Tonka and Sonny Fox. You heard Tonka George say it in his testimony. Quote, white man call that Ketchikan. Who call that Ketchikan, you know? Indian call that Ketchikan. This is the Nyanani. Thank you, Nyanani. Thank you, Nyanani. Thank you, Nyanani. 
So what do we do about it? Surely everyone has an opinion, but most notably the one which ignores the class to say the convenience. I would mean, take bring this matter back to court. The risk of blurs throughout the docket from 1901 would not be permissible, nor would large proven fraudulent actions like that of William Duncan. Use evidence from this research to defend reasons for the cruise passenger head tax to be allocated for more than just cruise related infrastructure. Revoke quick claim claims unless otherwise met with reparations. Correct the record, most importantly, rewrite the historic commission publications to reflect the historic cruise in Ketchikan. Change out place names in our community from fraudulent criminals like buildings like the Heckman Building and Ingersoll to notable indigenous landowners. So this change, however, I can thank you and a special thank you to Irene Demis for her guidance throughout her research, as well as James Lama Sr. for inspiring this project. Thank you. Or comments? I have a comment. Yeah. <clears throat> my my non, she uh, owned uh, behind Ohashi. Mm -hmm. And you have the deed of saying Indian Town, US State. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even to this day, uh, the city, you know, they try to make it really difficult to rebuild on that property because. There's so many, um, uh, well, part of the house, about two feet of it, apparently is on city property. Yeah. And then the back portion is supposedly, you know, there's all kinds of encroachments. Yeah. That. And if they, the house were able to burn down or be torn down, we wouldn't be able to build on it. Yeah, and I've noticed that even if you go like the Sidwell's portico, like on uh, the Ketchikan Borough website, I click on that and you can click per certain parts of like property throughout Ketchikan, and you can kind of see what who owns what at what point, even the years on these for you know, exchange conveyed. Um, and you can see, like, even on the Creek Street, an example of what you're talking about, where there'll be just like one small section that's owned by the city, but then you know, just things that were just sort of chopped up. Um, and it's it's very clear that it was purposeful because it's just so it, everywhere where it needed to live. Yeah, it, it didn't detour our family from rebuilding it. Is that the old William Brown room? It used to be, it used to be called Busey Way, but then yeah. it was changed to Brown Way. Yeah. And uh, it didn't deter us, mm -hmm. but it made it a lot you know, a lot more expensive and difficult, and they had to, you know, redo the foundation, and they had to replace one wall, and one wall, and one wall at a time, instead of tearing it down and then rebuilding. Which is, like, yeah, exactly what you're talking about, and not, like, that shouldn't have fallen on the end of the price of all of that. Yeah. And that was just something that I didn't know. Yeah, um, and I do, um, and I'm, I'm Feel free to go through this for anybody you'd like to because I'm the kind of person that will spend hours and find all of these keys, and I have quite a few deep advances and extraordinary. So, if anybody'd like to take a look and like that and copy, do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I know the, 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 the company, I don't want to speak to this one myself. Um, I think if people do have properties that they need to they want to rebuild, I know there's a lot that are hard to build on. There has been conversations to let people know about making it easier. Um, and if people are finding it hard, you know, they do all your rebuild for health. <laughs> um, but if there's others, um, I would highly recommend people bring it to the city council. Yeah, um, and a few years ago, I, I mean, I, when I first was trying to like learn about how like land was conveyed and like the whole um, kind of like, like if you study ASA just like fresh out of college and stuff, they're like, well, how come things are just so unfair? You know, and they, 
So I went to like a lot of like the borough board heads and I met with everybody and just talked about some questions. And um, from my understanding, um, they really want to open up more of the land and sort of go back to get more camp, um, land into private buildings. But my concern was that if, if that happened, then what opportunity would Native people have to get you know back into Native possession? Yeah, CD maybe like potentially, ideally, maybe you could use um, the evidence from this litigation because none of this was even available up until 2018. Um, it was confidential, and so it was just digitized last year. So now that it's accessible, it may be maybe it can be used as a groundwork for talking about litigation or you know. So one of the issues we have just from the Jordan first development, these are the arguments that were several parts and the names for the town. The budget on council. 2015. Yeah. Is that we're not allowed to use any of the funds at that because of the, the maritime law, which is right centuries old. Yeah. Um, and maybe this is one of the ways we argue because one of the, like Laura and my argument is that the, the funding that we make off that quote should be supporting our communities that is impeded and um the impact from tours impact our, our main infrastructure, which then in our community has to pay for. Right. And I was thinking that because of like the ground for which they won that 437 um, side plot addition survey, um, was that it has to be to the good of the people, the residents that actually live here. Um, and given that you, you you cannot, like as a resident, I can't just go anywhere I want dog at any time. Um, I've, I've been kicked off. I no longer have been kicked off. And I've worked with, um, you know, I've worked with a Native woman who was asked to leave because she was in regalia and um, a white man who had moved down there said that it was bad business. And so it's not it, because of, I mean, that's, I think that that's like a clear violation of like the purpose of that that timeline mission, you know, if there was a deal of bargain between the US federal government and the city council saying, yes, okay, fine, we'll reconvey it to where it's not necessarily a reservation, but as long as it's good for all of us that we live here. And clearly that's not the case. And and, and on that note, um, I brought that up at our council meeting recently. Yeah. And I would really appreciate when people just bring that to us because if that's happening, mm -hmm. that's not okay. Mm -hmm. That's not cool. Yeah. Um, and then that kind of thing. We're also going to be reconsidering mm -hmm. how um, sure. those foods are used and maintained and managed. Um, so if anyone has any suggestions on that, please. years old she, she had a 
great tradition for working for KIC. It was real bizarre. And <laughs> for all of those kids, and she kind of went to this timeline. Mm -hmm. And um, and I remember saying, you know, that there was an attempt to open up litigation and then it was denied. So yeah, and you can see that pattern like throughout like over like the last couple hundred years also because of the way that they had people in and out of that um, sort of land office and then the Department of Interior, and then they would um, prolong those cases so long by the time that was the time when somebody even would start from the beginning, which is why that 1901 case was like never really settled, and neither was Jenny Lynch, you know. They made a decision, but I think it's clear that it wasn't settled, you know. So, oh, yeah, oh, granted, yeah. How can one get a copy of what's in the I've got a copy for you. Andrea? Uh, first, uh, thanks for all the great information. It's really valuable. Um, uh, in, in addition to looking at litigation, uh, the possibility of that, I think that one thing is really important that we get out the vote. We can yeah. see that just uh, a few strokes of the pen. <laughs> Inappropriate laws and all the differences in the world. Oh, yeah. And we can get people in the office who are going to really uh, support the true uh, you know, laws and, and, and policies that don't that mm -hmm. don't do harm to the people mm -hmm. and get the right people in office. Mm -hmm. I think if, if our indigenous folks around the state, so we have several large populations in the state in particular, yeah. not out of the boat, got our young people engaged to be fundamentally changing the landscape of the political structure and spectrum in the state. And I mean, personally, I know a lot of um, a lot of political folks in, in office throughout all of the down the political spectrum to make sure they they, they, get, a, they get a photo by if an indigenous leader. Yes. When, when it's, you know, they'll make sure they're there to get that photo off. Oh, yeah. And they're behind the scenes driving policy in mm -hmm. That's not for our communities. So we also need to be aware of those things. So okay. we need to get out the phone. Mm -hmm. And that's inspiring people again. I 100% agree. And I'm just thinking that that is a big part of my struggle with being a small contribution. It's not like I want to power right now to change the world, but maybe education would help. And I think that a lot of people are unaware of this existing mystery and even just putting that out, making sure that the correct narratives, correct placenames, and things like that would probably encourage people to get out and vote and care about something that they may not even know about. Thank you. And how many teams are on the world coming up? <laughs> And of course, I think it's all right. We'll have two seats available. My term is, is over in 2024, but uh, I'll stay in, in, in politics as long as the community seats do, but to be here. Well, I'm like, right? I'll just sit in the chest room. And I always speak for myself from the city council. There's two seats coming up. This is their advice. I went around and was saying, uh, where it's rotation. Uh, I'll be talking about it. Better. Yeah. I'm thanking them. And thank you so much for doing so much research on this. Um, <clears throat> I know several years ago when KIC purchased that 38 acres and put that land in front back then, and at the time the attorney filled anchor shape. Was actually asking if there was any additional land established in Pepperdine that could potentially be put into leverage or trust. And I said, I don't know, you know, of any of the properties like now because I have, you know, I have no clue. I knew there was a couple pieces down there, I think, of uh, the Monet's family. I just don't know. I think it's the like the Shields family has six lots total. I know my I know the Shields family has six lots, and my mom has six deeds. Yeah, uh, and shared one with their family. Uh, and then where the pink building is, uh, before Martha Denny had passed away, yeah. she gave a whole bunch of information, like a um, whole bunch of like legal documents, and said. That land is should be our land, and and someone Phil was talking about this 
all those layouts that are potentially wetlands restricted deeds, the ones in Sacramento and the ones in Chechen County, can be turned into the simple land and trust lands right in downtown of those areas because of whatever they were titled under the specific mm -hmm. laws and rules. And then and you can see that in the mountains as well for them too. And so that, that's what kind of led me said, is there any large piece? In the country, and I said, oh, well, there's a peak building, you know, that all that building is, I said, and that's probably more recent. Mm -hmm. And so whatever that was worth, um, the attorney at the time said, well, he could potentially make that happen somewhere you could go into land, into trust, or or um, be simple land be that peak building. Yeah, he just needed additional background information. And that's because whatever that's worth, I'm just saying it. Um, and at the time, you know, Denmark had passed away, and so I didn't. Yeah. But, but thank you for thank you. Thank you for the office. Great question online. And so, thank you so much for allowing me to join you soon today. It's so difficult to make I was wondering if there's a transcript available. There it is. Um, they do charge for it. I like to talk, you know, I thought it was before you leave. There is a copy of that transcript as well, though. There you go. Is there anything else? <laughs> Oh, yeah, follow. I didn't realize you guys are going to do it. Yeah. 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 Yeah